It's in the middle of the week somewhere. And it was about a man who was an Episcopalian. And he, uh, he had indicated that, you know, when he was uh, raised up, he was raised up in church, he went off to college, drifted away, began life, began business, got married and all of that, and uh, eventually had a daughter. Didn't say how old the daughter was, but let's say 10. Thought it was time to go back to church. So probably an interval of 15, 18 years had passed since he had been in church, something like that. But when he went back to the Episcopal Church, not picking on any one now, when he went back to the Episcopal Church, he found that Jesus had left. They were no longer focused on the Lord. And so he was uh, disquieted, and he was dispirited, and, uh, you know, he was, just didn't know what to do. He noticed somewhere in that area that there was a Methodist church. This is not about Methodism. Methodist church having a revival, which was a Rick Bonham revival. That's why it was on his blog. And he went there and he was restored. So now, the question is this. How does something like that happen in a 15 or 18 year interval? How does a young man who vibrantly followed, loved the Lord, but, you know, going off to school, that happens. You know, other activities overtake you, overwhelm you, other endeavors, you're free for the first time, you can go crazy if you want, and that's usually what happens. And so, you, uh, and, then, and then, when you come back, then Jesus is not there. How does it happen? Well, um, if we were to go to um, Hebrews for just a moment, and I'll, I'll go over there, you don't have to go, because it's not, it's not, <laughs> it's not on the list of stuff that I gave you. So, um, <clears throat> And it, it gives in Hebrews chapter 1 a whole overview of the wonder of who Jesus was. Uh, and, you know, he is the exact likeness of Christ, of God, I should say, of, of the Father. And all these attributes, much higher than angels, and, and it goes through all this listing. And then in chapter 2, therefore we must pay uh, closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. And you think, really? So there's this awareness to the book of Hebrews that this is a, 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 a possibility and it's really a probability if we're not, if we don't have a, a focus, if we don't have a, a right focus. And there is a probability that we will drift away without the focus. And you think, well, well, you know, how does it really work? And it's subtle, it's very subtle how this stuff happens. All right, that was one example. Uh, then um, I was reading somewhere else, I'm not sure where I went, I went to several websites, and some were Methodists and some were others, and I noticed a kind of a pattern. Uh, when they would invite you to be part of who they were, uh, the, the sort of crowning jewel of the reason to come to their church is, was to come and encounter the love of Christ. Now that is the crowning jewel, if, if you follow what I mean. Of course that's the crowning jewel, to come and encounter the love of Christ. But let me tell you, it's both the crowning jewel and the greatest stumbling block all at the same time. Because we can get the love of Christ all mixed up with just social friendships and social niceness and having a, you know, a friendly congregation and all those kind of things. And those two things are really not the same. And then I'll be personal for just a moment. Um, while I was going through that, you know, for a very long time, I've asked God these sorts of prayers, these sorts of things. God, um, I feel such a void in relationship to your love. I, it's not that I don't know that you love me, I do. But there is such an absence of my love for other people. Now, I'm very aware of that. Now, I, I, I may overstate it a little bit so I make the point. I'm very aware that, you know, there are many, many times where, you know, I, 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 I just don't really love you. And what I mean by that is really love them. I like them. I love them in the generic sense. And you think, you mean us, preacher? You talk about us? You mean other people, right? You don't mean us. I do love you all. I just want you to hear, because I want you to think for yourselves too. 
We love people in the ideal. We love people when we're in our armchair. We love people when we're listening to music and reading our Bibles. We love people because the love of God is ambiently in us and in us. The difficulty there is between the from the ideal to the real deal, there's a gap. There is. From the ideal to the real deal, there's a gap. The real deal is doing something about this, moving beyond where you are in the ideal and impacting lives. Why? That's work. And so what have you thought about love in the ideal is not the same as love in the real deal. No one wants to say amen. So I prayed that walk. I pray. I, I, I talked to Carol every week, even from the very beginning when I first knew Carol. I was talking to her about this. How does this? How do you get there? How does this round go on and on and on? And so some of you are saying, "Well, you're just not praying enough." Well, that's always true. Okay. Can you pray too much? Well, maybe I don't know. Possibly. I, I don't answer that. That's too theologically advanced. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. And sure, we could pray more, you know. But a praying more prevents you from doing more is praying a good thing. You know, you got that some sort of balance of these things. Um, so, um, sure, we could pray more. But I don't know if this, I don't know if I just need to look up there and preach to me, or any of you can connect to what I'm saying and feel a void between the ideal way that we want to be and we feel and we understand and we receive from Christ and we know his goodness, we know his character, we know his nature, we know the unreserved measure by which he gives his heart to us. And that, we have that in the now, but it doesn't translate into the action that we want in our lives. Because there's so many other things that mitigate and come against it other needs, and love doesn't conquer all the time. Okay? We've got the premise. We're going to tell a story here over in Luke chapter 7. And, uh, you know, we're going to bring some issues up. You would say in your mind now, uh, and rightly so, that love is the fruit of the Spirit, Holy Spirit. You say amen to that. Amen. That is to say, there is a <clears throat> there is an ongoing um, advancement of the Holy Spirit in your life, producing the character of God. Amen. And that character of God is most completely understood in holiness and love. And uh, you know, the character of God is more understood in holiness than it is in love. But today, it's about love. And so we see the fruit of the Spirit is love. From love, all these other elements of the fruits of the Spirit are really birthed out of love. Love, joy, peace, patience, and all the rest. So we understand that the, the goal or the intent or the purpose or the drive of the Holy Spirit in us is to produce this. Jack quotes this a lot, that, that you know, that the, this is throughout the, the Bible we hear about the Holy Spirit. And yet, and we hear about greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. And we hear about all these things, and yet, when it comes to actually acting on it, it doesn't happen, one and two. Uh, the last time a survey was taken, which was a long time ago, maybe 15 or 18 years, no more than 4% of evangelical Christians, not Catholics, even people who believe that you must have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ in order to be with Him. You must have surrendered your heart to Him completely, Ask for forgiveness of sins and receive new life. Only 4% of people will name the name of Jesus to a stranger. And, and only in a safe place in church would they name the name of Jesus, but not where beyond that. 4%. So then you say to yourself, then you say to yourself, well, what's wrong? Where, how come love doesn't work? I think that's a fair question. At least, maybe that's Love works, but it's hard to get this question phrased. How come we don't see love working? How come we don't see love at work in our churches as much as we would hope? I don't mean to say that being together, now hear me now, being together, 
enjoying one another, having fun with one another, spirit loving spirit in the sense that we just have joy being together and all those kind of things where there's just that goodness of being together, whether in fellowship times or other times. I'm not saying for a moment that God doesn't want that for all of us. He wants that and more so. So we have to sort of see that truly like that. But then there's this other aspect to this that we're going to look at today a little bit. So I want us just to sort of be sensitive to what the scripture says to us here with this. Um, here in, in, the, in Luke chapter 7. Sensitive to where people are in the scripture. There are two stories about a lady with an alabaster box. This is one of them. And there's another story where people get upset and say the money could have been used elsewhere, but it's other circumstances, different context, a different story. This story, and we'll start it. <clears throat> it's um, uh, Luke 7 and starting in verse 36. My, uh, my version may not quite coordinate with what's on the screen, but it's pretty close, I'm sure. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and they went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And behold, the woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair, with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who, get these words, I hope it says that up there. Yeah, he would have known who and what sort of a person this woman is. It's very interesting words. He would have known who she was and what kind of a woman that she was. So, Almost certainly a prostitute, a woman of ill repute, whatever way you want to say that. Uh, clearly classified as a sinner. I don't know, let me read it all the way through and we'll go back into it. Um, and what sort of a woman uh, this who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Son, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, You see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, her sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to them, when Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. It's very important to get that last part. Her faith has saved you. Go in peace. The important question in all of this is, Who is this? I mean, it's a vital question. Who is this? Who is this? Um, I don't know. Perhaps some of you have had some financial weight bearing down in your life. If you didn't pay this, you might go to prison. If you didn't pay this, you might be thrown out of your house. If you weren't able to come up with these taxes, this property would be taken away. Uh, some of you have, some of you maybe not in other ways. 
I remember a case which is similar to whereby there was a judgment pending against me for about five or six years for about $140,000. I didn't have a penny. And, you know, I mean, in your my mind's eye, humanly speaking, that amount was so big and it wouldn't go away. And, you know, year by year, if it doesn't go away, it gets bigger. Could we say amen to that? Amen. It just gets bigger because it's always there. Then it gets so deep, it, you can't even move. Your emotions are always dragging that thing around. Your ambient well-being has been taken captive. Can anyone hear me? Yes. Okay, this might not be, this may be a relationship where someone is constantly berating you. Someone is constantly on you, constantly dogging you, constantly. No matter what you do, it's not right, they're critical, and whatever the case is, you just know when you get around this person, this is what it's going to be like. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I don't think this is going to be long. Uh, sermon. Incidentally, the Lord uh, told me back over here, just over here, a little while ago, and this is odd, the Lord sort of said to me, Alan, you know, this is not your sermon. This, this is my sermon. You know, I'm not, but I get that. Amen. Well, yeah, amen is right, but, you know, that annoyed me. <laughs> I was committed to this sermon. <laughs> oh, see, you don't want to be that human, do you? Oh. Yeah, we're human. We're human. <laughs> so, so, yes, sir. So, um, so if you go anywhere once to go now, I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not, there's no text there, I've got no notes, so it just goes wherever he's going to take it. So, I, I want to say this, though, about this particular matter. Um, if you own the IRS, and I make some figures up, $48,000, and you've got $48, there's a bit of a gap there. And you know, the IRS, their numbers are, oh gosh, we understand. <laughs> we understand, life is hard. We understand, you need 140 years to, to cope with this. <laughs> It's not, they don't work like that. <laughs> they don't. It doesn't work like that. It's a weight that's on you. But let's say, you know, after two years, they realize we can shake this guy. And it's like shaking a tree, but there's no fruit on the tree. And no matter how hard we shake him, no money's going to come. You know, after a while, they're going to come back to you and say, you know, the hundred whatever figure I used before, whatever that is, 48,000, how about 4,800? They might say that mm -hmm. after a while. Mm -hmm. They might. <laughs> don't leave, don't leave. <laughs> well, I, if, if that's you, I, I claim not owe you that they will say that, in, in, uh, you know, whatever the case is. And let's say that does happen, and you pay that 4,800 out. You, you've got a 24 month time frame or something. And then when you have it, it's like, it's like hallelujah time. Amen. You can't even understand. I remember when this happened in my life, I, I finally realized I had the greatest dud for a lawyer that's just the worst character, just absolutely, just a muddle, just muddled and, and bubbled around. And I don't, you know, he, he, I don't know how I got, and so finally, I ditched this guy and found a progressive guy. I told you this story before, a progressive guy. And I went to see him and I told him my circumstances. He says to me, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a Methodist pastor. I don't want your case. So he right up, right up, he told me. You know, right away, I was both angry with him and I really liked the guy. Because it's, you know, it's, whatever his reason was, he was straight up. That's my kind of guy. He says, you preachers, you, you just think everybody ought to be a charity case and do favors and and get away with stuff and not have to pay your way. I don't want any part of this. I thought, he's my God. I just love this guy. If that's what you want, my wife, I'm telling you what, that's what you want. So I, uh, he said, yeah, I'm not going to do anything unless you come up with $1,000. Just to let me look at your little stuff. Well, you know, I thought like $140. So he was right. Why should he take me? I had no money. So I went around, fine, around, fine, fine, I came up $1,000. And it worked. 
Within six months, he had the whole thing taken care of. Amen. Amen. Now, hey, I, I couldn't believe the way it made me feel. It's just extraordinary. Now, let's press in a little bit more. So, in my case, it was a sort of a, the other side believing that I did owe it, so it was sort of a debt. I didn't believe it, but they did so. I know that there are sometimes people owe some company, and perhaps, perhaps you owe the hospital, okay? And I know, and be quiet now, everyone, because people here are paying money to the hospital in this church, and in this church, people have been forgiving their debts in the hospital. So don't identify each other, okay? Really? Well, if you owe the hospital X amount of money, let's say $14,000 or something like that, and you, you plead your case and so forth and so on, they take it under review, take it under review, and then they send you a letter and say, um, Mrs. Jones, we've decided that, uh, that, um, that we want to uh, cancel this debt, wipe it out completely, and you no longer owe us any money whatsoever. Amen. You're going to be over the moon. Amen. You're going to be over the moon. Now let's press it a little bit more. At this point, you can't think of anything but you. I no longer have to bear this up. I no longer have to walk around with this constantly on me. Because if you've never been there, you don't know what this feels like. Constantly on me. It never goes away. The weight of it is always there. You can delay it or put it to the side. To some degree. You can have a coping mechanism. You can do some of those things. But it's always there. At some level, it's always there gnawing or saying it has to be dealt with. You can shield yourself some, but it's always there. So when the relief comes, you say hallelujah, and you're just elated and all that kind of stuff. Amen. Now, but let's think about it a little further. So what about the hospital? Here's how we would look at that. That's a big organization. They can absorb that. No big deal. So we don't really give that much thought whatsoever. We just think in a sort of a, a generic, global, corporate kind of entity way that they can, that's, that's a drop in the bucket for them. Therefore, it's as if it doesn't count. This is where we begin to get off track as Christians, right here. As if it doesn't count. Now, well, let's go back to the text. It says that the woman was saved by faith. Early on in the text it says, when she learned that this man was in the house, right? Remember, it was this man. Because the Pharisee had asked him, this teacher, to come in, the son of man, to come in. And later on they're, they're speculating to themselves, who is this man? So it's this man that's in the house. But God has given this woman a wonderful quotient measure of faith. When she learned that he was in the house, she went and got something to bless him. She learned and got, she, she learned who he was. She went and got and brought her very hard emotions and perhaps all that she had in this alabaster box. And what she was going to do was minister unto him, bless him, love him, and so forth and so on. And the question here is, did she have the faith to know that whatever, whoever this man is from God, she had the faith to know that he would take this from me. Now that's a good start. He would take this from me. Take what from me? Being an outcast. Being rejected. Not having friends. Not having any place in society. Not having any place in the community. Not having any standing place. Being talked about, whispered about, all that kind of stuff. All the Pharisees getting all big, pointing and so forth and so on. Then at night probably creeping off and being on her lips. That's how it works. But... That could never come forth. That find a way to stone her. She believed from God. She had faith to believe that somehow this man could take it from her. Amen. 
somehow this man could take that's different now he would take it from her so that she would be free and see it is the knowing that he would take it from her and could take it from her and it would be valid and completely valid regardless as to what others thought of her because that's probably not going to change but it's going to change something in her can you say amen she is not going to see herself the same way. She is not going to accept what everybody else to think of her. She knows that she's going to be different if this man takes it from her. And therefore, there is a response that comes out of this. And this response is love. Now, this is, we've got to grapple with this. You think, really? I want to propose to you this. That we occlude, get in the way, hinder the work of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our life on this very area. I want you to give you a sort of a, a scripture on the other side of this to give us some, some helpful information. It says, in the latter times that the love of man, that is the love of God through man, will wax lean, will not be evident, will not work, will not be an operation. Why? Because of lawlessness. That is to say, counting sins as if to no account. Now, I'm not saying that people were right there to ostracize this woman, socially labor her as, as just being, um, you know, second or third class or not worth talking to or not really able to have a life or anything. I'm not saying that was right. But what is right in it is that they at least thought to some degree that what she's doing is contrary to the law. It's contrary to where we are with the law. Now, I, I want you to hear my heart here because it's God's heart. What happens to us is we get pulled with society and society now would look and so many things that are biblical would say, well, they're not really so bad. You have to see it through the eyes of grace. You have to understand what tolerance means. You have to understand that these things uh, shouldn't be dealt with so harshly and so forth and so on. And what happens is we focus um, our attention into a soulish realm. Now, you know, I'm not going to go through a list of sins, although I was tempted to. A list of sins that are not socially acceptable. But you devise your own list. You about the, the sins that are biblical prohibitions that are socially acceptable. We all go along with them because the world out there goes along with them. And because the world goes along with them, we don't really want to be seen as sort of being critical, harsh, judgmental, that sort of thing. But I tell you, if we, God's church, lose track of this reality. It says that her sins were great. These two things are connected. Her sins were great. If we do not take account of our sins, if we do not put a value in our sins, then what, we will, hap what will happen to us, we will never truly love the way God wants us to love. Right. I'm going to put this to you another way. Recently, I watched an old movie Way back, tell way, way, way back. And um, 60 years old with Richard Burton. It's called The uh, Bro. Back then, they actually, Hollywood, uh, did a very, very credible job of, um, of promoting the Christian story, promoting the power of Christ, mm. promoting what happened. And there's a very vivid, compelling scene in there where the Roman officer who was charged to do the executions was there up on the mound. And um, uh, so they were doing the lots for the, for the rope, for the storm. And it began to storm a little bit and all that kind of stuff. And uh, part of the drama of the scene is that someone was looking up at him and and there was a little fear in their eyes, and the centurion was very bold and very Roman and very, uh, you know, harsh and all that. So he couldn't. So he got back over there to look at this guy up in 
this cross. You know, he was saying, it doesn't matter what they think about me. It doesn't matter. I have been redeemed. I have been forgiven. My sins have been grievous. I've given them to Jesus. Now I'm able to love. He's released me to love. The power of God has released me so I can truly love. How many of us truly want to love? And not dismiss how we live our life or how our communities live our life. How will we ever have a word for them? How will we ever say, if we say come to church where you can encounter the love of Christ, and what we really mean is you can meet friendly people, we lie to them. We lie to them. We have to have love from Christ that is sacrificial. It's sacrificial. It wants to. It is pure. It wants to touch those around it. You know what? I lack that in my heart, and I long for that in my heart, and I ask the Lord to do that for in my heart. And if that's you, then I ask you to be aware of it. And this is just symbolism. It's not magic. So, it's up to you. It's up to you. If you want to be up there, if you want to, as it were, sort of sense that His blood was shed on you and for you, this has to be for a moment. My heart to you is that there's no condemnation in this. It's purely conviction. It is an awareness. It is an awareness of who you are, who you were, and what he's done for you. It's simply that awareness. I think it's a nice thing to sense or feel his blood on you. It makes it personal. Jesus, you died for me. That blood was for me, Jesus. It releases you. You come into agreement. You acknowledge who you were. Now, I'm not saying if you sit in your seat that there's something wrong with you. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying if you sit in your seat that you can't love. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying this opportunity is for you. I sense that in faith, if you do this, you'll be released. That's my sense. I think that's what God has uh, given to us today. That if you come and say, yes, my, I acknowledge my sins, just like this woman did. I acknowledge, and I know Jesus takes them away, and his blood was shed for me. 